on the vault. High atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Talking Catholic. I'm Jen Morrow, and with me, as always, today is Mike Walsh. Hello, Mike. Hi, Jen. We're exactly one floor away from each other, and we're recording on Zoom. Yes, we are. It feels like we're so far apart, and yet so far apart. And yet, <laughs> the fact that I saw you so early this morning in my office, what are you going to do? Hey, that the, was I, an invite. That you invited me up, considering the fact that you never like to see people before 9 o'clock. I think it was 9.30. So I think uh, to be clear, I didn't invite you up. You said I wanted to talk to you, and I said the only time I had was until 10.45 in the morning, and you appeared. I feel no. like that's still an invite. That's as close I'm ever going to get, so I'm going to take it. No, no, no. <laughs> nice try, though. Uh, uh, so how are you? We, What's going on? It is a busy time in the Catholic Church uh, on so many levels, but particularly for the communications director of the Diocese of Camden. We have a ton of stuff going on. I am. I figure I've got about 19 things I'm late on right now, which uh, to everybody who's waiting on stuff for me, I'm admitting that I'm I'm late to it. So enjoy <laughs> this podcast. The um, we have a we have a really great event coming up soon that I hope at some point my life gets freed up so I can actually focus on it a little bit. It's the uh, Catholic Charities Annual Dinner used to be referred to as the Justice for All Dinner. Uh, it's taking place on October 25th in Atlantic City, New Jersey, at Resorts uh, Conference Center, and uh, it's a great event. It's one I've been a part of. Every year I've been at the diocese, I think. So seven years going on. Oh, I just celebrated my seventh year at the diocese, by the way. Yay. Yeah. It's wait, the, wait, it's wait. The, like recently? Like just now? Yeah, like the Tuesday after Columbus Day, which I totally forgot that I was, it was my anniversary. Well, happy anniversary. Thank you very much. It continues to be the, uh, my, this, my longest term employment, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I do believe you've mentioned that before. They so have congratulations. Not Thank you. I, I, at some point, they're going to figure out how to get a, get a, uh, get rid of me, but it hasn't happened yet. But uh, but anyway, the Catholic Charities Annual Dinner, yeah, it's coming up at the end of the month, and uh, we're honoring the Disciples of Mercy from all around the diocese, people who have um, really done great works, uh, particularly with, related to social justice in South Jersey. We have a number of people who have really done wonderful things in their community, um, and uh, they're people who are certainly deserving of the honor. And then we're also honoring the chairman of the Virtual, uh, Virtual Health System, uh, Dennis Pullen, who Virtua several years ago took over one of our Catholic uh, hospitals and has done a phenomenal job of maintaining its Catholic identity. And uh, we've been very pleased with that and the working relationship we've had with uh, Mr. Pullen and all the work he's done in the community with his uh, uh, mobile food markets and things of that nature. So uh, it's a great event. If anybody would like to come to it, I would encourage you to check out uh, catholiccharitiescamden.org slash CCAD if you want to be specific. And you can learn more about how you can come to the Catholic Charities Annual Dinner. It's always a great night. Um, I'll be the person running around with my head cut off, uh, making sure everything moves around. And uh, it's a great night. And you haven't been to one yet, have you, Jen? I have not been to one in the Diocese of Camden. I, I was at one in my former role in the Diocese of Trenton. And I'll, I'll tell you what I loved about it was just, um, first off, it's usually a great meal, da- uh, dancing, music, uh, and, and but better. No? No dancing or music? No, no dancing, please. No? There's no dancing? No. Is there music? Do I, look, do I look like the kind of person who would put on an event that includes dancing? That's true. Okay. There will not be dancing, but there will be great food. And more importantly, we get to interact with other faithful Catholic uh, in our diocese. And that's Catholics in our diocese. And that's what I'm looking forward to is not only meeting some of the people that we've done articles about, but meeting um, new people that I can do future articles about. So uh, it should be a great night. So I would say anybody who's never been to this, please come out because you won't be disappointed. It'll just be a great night to share your faith and get to know other like-minded uh, yep. faithful people and and I, I can confirm that uh, while we do not have dancing we do have outstanding food so <laughs> so it's 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 a good night if you want to if you want to eat and uh the presentations are good and i will also tell you that if you attend i have there's only one standing rule from the bishop we need to be done at nine o'clock and we have never gone more than four minutes over and when really? we did go over at no time was it my fault so <laughs> 
<laughs> you going on the record to say that on your seventh, the week of oh, your seventh anniversary? I, only because the person isn't here to defend himself, but he knows who he is as to why. Yeah. And it's not the bishop; it's somebody else who uh, decides to speak extemporane- extemporaneously and uh, always goes over his time. But oh. uh, we will uh, we will do something soon. So anyway, it's a great night. So I hope people will come out to it. But we have another event going on in the diocese too, of which is the reason we are having this podcast today. We do. So we have a very exciting um, event coming up uh, October 22nd from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in um, in Sewell. It's the Hunger for Justice, Exploring Hunger in Our Country and Our World and Long-Term Solutions. So that's what we're going to be speaking about today. It's being hosted by the Diocesan Office of Life and Justice Ministries. And anybody who comes to the event can learn, you know, how to to be part of the solution for, to, to solve, I, I would say, local, national, international hunger and, and so, you know, just how to help. So we have a great panel. We have a big panel today, so it should be pretty exciting. Um, so I'm going to introduce everybody on the, uh, on the show. We have our good friend, Donna Ottaviano Britt, the Secretariat for Pastoral Outreach. Hello, Donna. Hey, Jen. How are you doing? Thanks for doing this. Yeah, I'm excited. This will be a good one. I mean, they're all good ones, but I'm excited to have such a big panel. It's fun. <laughs> um, we have Father uh, Ken Hallahan, who is a retired priest of the Diocese of Camden. He's been uh, a long time, for a long time, involved in justice issues. And he also currently uh, preaches often at St. Oh, geez. St. Jochum in Belmar. Did I get it? That's Father? close enough. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Nice to be As here. anybody who has listened to this show knows, I have a lot of trouble with pronunciation. So, <laughs> it's so this good to true. have you, Father. Thank you. Nice to be here. We have uh, Pat Slater uh, from the Catholic Community of Christ Our Light in Cherry Hill, who is the Pastoral Associate for Justice and Community Outreach. Greetings, Pat. It's good to meet you. Thank you. Glad to be here. And we have Jessica Morell, who has been on our show before. She's the Community Engagement Man- uh, Manager for Catholic Relief Services. And we are very excited to invite you back for your second second turn on the podcast. Thanks so much. I'm thrilled to be here. And I can't believe you actually invited me back. So um, <laughs> I was like, oh, yes, I must not have done that poorly. So I'm oh. thrilled to talk about this upcoming event and to uh, be a part. So thanks, everyone. So, well, no, we're happy to have you. I, I do want to note that uh, all of the people here on the podcast are will either be presenting or have been involved with organizing the Hunger for Justice. Um, one of those not on the podcast with us is Sherry Andes, Andes of Red for the World. She will be involved in the presentations on October 22nd, so she couldn't join the podcast. So just wanted to make sure she's noticed and that uh, can't wait to hear what she has to say on, on Saturday. So um, Donna, why, uh, or would you like to explain how this event came about and, and why? So I, uh, I would love to share that this amazing group of individuals that was assembled as the previous Life and Justice Director departed us, uh, really assembled these leaders of the um, Catholic Social Teaching Ministries, really, from a number of parishes, of which Pat Slater is a part. Um, and so they have been patiently waiting for someone to take the office of life and justice. And we haven't found the right person to lead the office yet. Um, But so they have patiently put up with me who leads a different office for the diocese. So uh, and doing my best to support everybody in the diocese that works in the life and justice space. And so Pat and her other, the other members of the core team, as I engage with them over this last year plus, and as we, reached the end of the pandemic and it was time to gather people again. It was time to sort of reboot and go back and and do the work that's necessary across the diocese. How this team came and said, listen, we need to support the social justice ministries and the parishes. We have this idea. We think there should be an event. We'd love to start with hunger. Um, So can you help us? And so that's really where it started. It started with them uh, really kind of targeting an opportunity to bring those who work and serve in the space uh, across the diocese to give them a day that enriches them, that actually gives them spiritual nourishment, but also to their credit, really taking an opportunity 
and, and you'll hear them talk about it. They'll speak about it much more elegantly and eloquently than I do. But an opportunity to not only hear about what it's like to care for the needs of those who are hungry, those who suffer from food insecurity, but what people will get out of this workshop is actually equipping, right, of the leaders who work in this space. And so they're going to learn around what it's like to advocate for the hungry, for those that are food insecure. And I'm going to let them talk about this because you already introduced Father Ken, you've already in, in, introduced Jessica. They're two of our speakers along with Sherry. But I think it's a real opportunity to come for training, for equipping, and learn how to advocate for the hungry. So hopefully I've set that up properly, but I'll leave it to Father Ken and Jessica and Pat Slater in particular to, to fill in what I may have missed. So Father Ken, can you add to that and, and speak a little bit more to that? Well, I'm looking forward to our meeting on the 22nd, Saturday the 22nd. And uh, from what I understand, we'll be hearing from the parishes. I think there are 16 parishes that have life and justice ministries. And uh, each parish, is a, uh, many of them are uh, focused on one particular topic, but we decided to uh, uh, focus on hunger since hunger, is such, uh, food is such a basic need for everyone. And um, there, uh, my, my own role in this will be to uh, 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 point out the Catholic social teachings that uh, uh, relate to hunger. Uh, uh, so maybe, maybe Pat could set us up a little bit more for the... Uh, um, the 22nd and what we're going to experience there. Well, part of the background for why we wanted to do this is the intersection of, of the fact that hunger, a hunger is such a universal need. And the fact that hunger exists in our world at all is a scandal, but we have that intersection with the political, um, movement now with the reauthorization of the farm bill in 2023. So that is being crafted right now. So this is the time for um, Catholics, Christians, all people of goodwill to jump in and make sure that this bill really reflects and addresses the needs of people in our country and around the world. So our core team of these life and justice leaders uh, said, you know, a lot of us have food pantries, or we're working in soup kitchens and doing all this really, really good work. But if we don't address the systemic things that are uh, creating hunger and not addressing hunger, then we're just going to continue to be limping along, you know, in trying to address this issue. So this is one of the reasons we chose this, because it is just a prime time to jump in around the, the reauthorization of the farm bill. And Jessica can talk a lot more about the farm bill because she's working on that. Thanks, Pat. Um, yes, I, I am thrilled to share with you all, as for those who, of you who might not know, um, CRS, Catholic Relief Services, is the international extension of the United States bishops and Catholics. So we are the Catholic action and the Catholic voice overseas. Um, so while the farm bill has many, many parts and um, Sherry from Bread from the World is gonna give great examples of how the farm bill affects us right here in the US. Um, at CRS, the farm bill really impacts the humanitarian aid overseas and internationally. And advocating with all of our, our representatives and our senators is so important starting to form relationships and letting them know that as Catholics, we care that people are hungry. We care that people are starving um, and hunger is causing so much displacement and migration and conflict and letting them know we care and speaking up and using our voice um, to speak for those who don't have that voice um, can really make a big difference. So there's all types of parts to the farm mill. Um, I'll be focusing on at the event. I'm really excited um, within CRS's scope would be Title III um, that incorporates a couple different programs I'm going to be sharing about and why that's important for international aid and the work CRS is doing all over the world. For example, I think it's hard to not know about what's going on in Ethiopia and Somalia. Um, it, they're, they're, people are dying every day of, from hunger and um, the programs 
some, many funded by the Farm Bill and by a lot of generous <laughs> uh, donations and other programs, but there's over 7.7 million people in Ethiopia alone being served by our CRS programs, which we are the Catholic Church of the U.S. So it is you all. It is the Catholics and those of good faith here in the U.S. that are sponsoring that. And in Somalia, over 70,000. Um, and that includes food and health care and other needs. So Hunger is a global issue and we need those programs like the Farm Bill. Um, and it will not be reallocated until September of 2023. But now is the time, as Pat said, now is the time to start letting our Congress and our senators know that we care about this and we care about others. Um, so, yeah, just a little spiel. But I think, <laughs> Father Ken, you have a great, um, you know, uh, I loved hearing from you about charity and justice and, and, and why it's important that we care about people being hungry. So maybe I'll flip it back to you real quick. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, let me say a word about food first. I like food and uh, I find food a really fascinating subject because it touches people on their individual level. I mean, we have to have food. Uh, we can live quite a few days. You know, the hunger strikers lasted, some of them lasted 60 and 70 days. But, uh, you know, we can only last a few minutes without air. We can last, last a few days without water. We can last, you know, a few weeks without food. But food is really a basic necessity. But it's also an expression. People who cook um, or even people, uh, anybody who eats, they often have favorite foods. They have foods that uh, express something about their person, their personality or uh, their their relation to the material world. Food is also a cultural phenomenon. I, I do a lot of presentations on multicultural uh, sensitivity, and I usually start off with food because I find food is a non-threatening topic. Everybody eats, and many people do like to try foods of, of other cultures. But uh, food is, is interesting then from that perspective that it, it also expresses uh, people's cultural awareness. Uh, and thirdly, uh, food is often uh, related to faith. I mean, we have we pray the mass and we use bread and wine. Uh, the Jewish people, of course, have the Passover meal for their great uh, uh, celebration each year of their faith. The Muslims approach food by using fasting. And, and there are certain kinds of foods also that are not allowed by religions. And the Muslims and the Jews both have their restrictions on food. The Catholics used to have restrictions, too, more so than we do now. So food's kind of an interesting topic that touches us on many levels of our lives. And in this uh, presentation we're going to uh, uh, make on the 22nd, the, the two dimensions that we're going to talk about are love and justice. Love generally means relating to people one-to-one, -one, relating to people uh, person to person, meeting people face to face, as uh, uh, St. Uh, John Paul II, Pope John Paul II said in his, uh, his uh, homily at Yankee Stadium back in 1979, he said, you know, it's good to do the acts of charity because in charity, you often you meet people face to face. And when you meet people face to face, you get to know them a little bit better. And then you also appreciate what you have. If you were the giver in, a, in, a, in an encounter of giving and receiving, you realize that there's very little difference between you and the person who is receiving. And so uh, it's good to do charity. It's good to do face-to-face -face, uh, assistance. And the Catholic Church has been doing that, of course, for centuries. We've always recognized food as a basic need, and the Catholic Church has always encouraged people to feed the hungry. Jesus did, of course. He said, "You," when, and Jesus, in fact, says, when you saw, see someone hungry, you are looking at me. And, and everybody in the last judgment uh, scene is surprised when they saw him there. But Jesus says, yeah, when you meet the hungry person individually, you face me. But the Catholic Church over the centuries, and it's particularly in the last uh, 70 or 80 years, has recognized the need to address issues like hunger, not just from an individual, personal, charitable point of view, but also from the, the, the view of structure. And as uh, Pat said, uh, we have structural issues here. Food is uh, not magical. Food is not produced magically. It's produced by human decision. And right now, in a modern world with 8 billion people, we produce food through the systems and structures and institutions that uh, create the food, that deliver it, to prepare it, that uh, sell it to us. And so we need to look at all those systems and structures and institutions. Uh, as, uh, again, Pope John Paul said, uh, that we need to look for the reasons why 
there is poverty or look for the reasons why there is hunger. And many times it's very uncomfortable to look at the reasons because many times we are implicated in systems and structures and institutions that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're, they're, they are privileging certain people and they're uh, uh, preventing other people from getting the opportunity to have food. So uh, those two dimensions of love, the personal individual outreach, and then the institutional structural change that is needed are the two approaches that we'll be uh, looking at on October the 22nd. I really like that you're talking about the institutional because I, I think that it's sometimes that that might be part of the part uh, part of the things that we we forget. I mean, the fact that you just said food is produced by human decision. I mean, that is that institutional part that oh we don't think about. We're thinking about let me go serve at the food bank, and which is also great, but it's it's taking it that next step and paying attention to what the farm bill is or the you uh, the Global Child Thrive Act. We have to kind of put two and two together. Um, to, to make it work. And it sounds like we'll be learning about both of those skills at, on October 22nd. Yes. Um, no, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, Jen, I have to say, and um, Father, you set me up so perfectly for this, but um, yes. that's why I think it, it's so, this, this advocacy is so important for the programs that are occurring. For example, CRS, we refer to it as Integral Human Development or IHD a lot of acronyms in the world, but it's about the spiritual, the social, political, financial, natural, and physical um, things. And that's why the funding for these programs and to advocate are so important so that it's more than just the charity. Sometimes it is important, you know, to, to feed um, the hungry and to feed people um, that might need it. But what's important is to empower and to provide justice. Um, and through um, the programs that we're offering overseas, it, for example, the farmer to farmer program where we have farmer internships overseas, the Farm Bill funds that program where we can send farmers to help integrate and to teach farmers and other developing uh, nations how to maybe grow a new crop with more nutrients or with the way that the climate is changing, how can we find new crops that might grow? So it just, it really presses for me and it presses on, you know, my heart and my faith of what's the real, you know, what's the true solution. And Pat, Father Ken, you know, you both, you both touched on that. And that's why I think it's so important, um, this integral human development and what CRS is doing. Um, yes, sometimes we need to drop food to places, you know, there's disasters, there's crisis, but it's really about getting to that root cause and making, making changes and I think so often we um, forget that the, the, the poor, they have the resiliency in them to lift themselves up, but not everyone might have the structure or the government or the funding that um, we can help provide, which is why things like, you know, the farm bill um, are important. So I just had to kind of, uh, you set me up so great. So I had to try to. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, just to. <laughs> Just to piggyback on what you said, too, the I heard uh, Governor uh, DeSantis of Florida the other day before the storm hit, and he said, oh, yes, as soon as, uh, as, soon as the storm hits, we'll be calling all the churches. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. We're not going to be calling the Little League, and we're not going to be calling Hollywood, and we're not going to be calling, the, uh, you know, the professional sports. We're going to call the churches because the churches have are a system, a structure, and an institution, and they're in place, and they have people, and they know how to uh, meet people's needs. And I think this uh, the issue of addressing the laws is also a part of our role as Catholics, that we need to step forward and espouse the values that we stand for and ask for those values to be implemented in law, because the law is an expression of the culture, it's an expression of the country, and uh, we really cannot address the issues of hunger without addressing uh, the laws that control the, the creation of food and the distribution of food. It's, and as Pat said, you know, it's, it's really a scandal. The part of the reason why it's a scandal that people are hungry today is that we probably grow enough food to feed 20 or 30 billion people. But because of the way we eat, and when we eat uh, large amounts of meat, for example, we eat much more of the food supply Every time I eat a steak, I'm, for every pound of steak I eat, I mean about 15 pounds of grain. And for every chicken I eat, I'm eating uh, about five or six pounds of grain. We grow enough grain, grains, there are about 12 grains that human beings eat, 
And if we all just ate grains, we could feed probably 30 million people. But uh, th that's just one issue. But there are issues like that. There are structural issues and there are decisions. I mean, we eat very differently now in the United States, partly because of all the advertising, partly because of government policy of which types of products, which types of <clears throat> animals were uh, uh, are fed, which types of animals are raised. Uh, sometimes we make uh, very good decisions about, about uh, increasing the food supply, but sometimes we make very risky decisions. Um, just one uh, that comes to mind is the the whole fear now of avian flu, because avian flu, they're, they're just terrified. All the scientists in the world have warned because with the chickens, now chickens almost everywhere in the world, the chickens have been reduced to just, I think, one species and maybe a few a few extra species just for, for color. But uh, they're so afraid that if a, an avian flu breaks out among the chickens, it'll wipe out the chicken supply in the entire world. In, in Vietnam, about 15 years ago, there was a, an avian flu, flu outbreak the Vietnamese government was encouraged by everybody and paid to kill every single chicken in the country because it is so dangerous to have an avian flu break out among chickens. So that's just, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a peripheral issue to what we're going to be addressing on the, the 22nd, but it just shows that there are policies, public policies of how we do food, how we make it, how we process it, how we distribute it, that have an enormous impact on, on who gets to eat and how much and what kind of foods that they eat. I, I think, too, this is an opportunity to realize or to uh, establish that lens that budgets are moral documents. Mm -hmm. So that when we make a budget for our family, for our, our company, our churches even, that's a moral document. This is saying... What is most important, you know, in our society? And the reason people are hungry, again, as Father Ken said, it's not for food so shortage. It's because people are poor, plain and simple. And, and they're feeling the pinch even more now, you know, with inflation. So, I mean, they're more and more on the edge. So the people who, you know, were just kind of on the edge there with hunger, you know, they're experiencing food insecurity they probably are now falling into real hunger at this point because food has become so expensive. Um, so again, to look at um, it, when our government sets priorities, you know, in budgets, where are people who are poor incorporated into those budgets? So in the farm bill, is this subsidizing agribusiness, you know, or is this subsidizing uh, farmers, uh, for example, minority farmers who get very, very little subsidy from, from the government, but could and could thrive and, you know, um, put the emphasis back on agriculture rather than agribusiness, you know, and be more local rather than shipping um, vegetables and fruits clear across the country. So like one of the um, things that's kind of interesting, we, we do a mission trip down to um, David, Kentucky, and in that area, it's coal country, which, of course, coal is pretty much bust at this, this point. But um, some of the uh, locals are now creating farms under greenhouses because, you know, Kentucky goes through, you know, the, uh, the same kind of weather that we do. But um, so they're creating these huge greenhouses to create tomato or grow tomatoes or other things that are, are uh, good for people. And then they ship them from Kentucky to New Jersey instead of from California to New Jersey. So the fact that, you know, something like that is creative, that those things should be encouraged and subsidized and, and applauded, you know, uh, celebrated as creative solutions. When I worked in the Diocese of Richmond, one of the, the, um, Nonprofits out in Appalachia worked with uh, people who grew tobacco. And of course, you know, uh, tobacco, the tobacco, you know, market in the United States has fallen worldwide. It, it hasn't. But he worked with tobacco farmers, former tobacco farmers, to teach them how to do organic gardening. So again, something very creative. And then this nonprofit also found the market, you know, for people to sell their organic produce. 
So it's that kind of thinking, I think, that has to be encouraged by these kind of budgets. Pat, I mean, I think what you're saying here is that there's so many levels to food insecurity that on the everyday basis, we might not even realize or be thinking about. Uh, and I, that's, you know, part of the, the, the discussions that will be on the 22nd. Yes. And I, th- I think that, you know, those of us who, you know, have food pantries or, you know, work in soup kitchens and everything don't realize that our major goal should be to put ourselves out of business. You know, to make, sh- to create the, the, the point where we do not have to have these because people are food secure, you know, in our world. And so, in, you know, instead we focus on like, let's collect more cans or collect more money or, you know, do all of these things when, and I think that's where the efficacy comes in. It's creating that mindset. Like the major thing I need to do is create a world where there is no need for our food pantry or our soup kitchen because everybody has enough. Our God is a God of abundance and not a scarcity. And so how do we open up our hands as, as people, but as a nation as well, to make sure that people are able to share in this abundance? Pat, you, you said that so well. And um, one of the talking points um, we provide with for advocacy from CRS is that as people of faith seeking justice, we believe there's a moral obligation to provide assistance and address the root causes of poverty. And um, I mean, you, I think you just, you know, you said that is so well. And I think advocacy for some people might seem a little daunting. And Pat, I know we've talked before, we've met before, and you have way more experience this at, at this than I do, writing letters and having meetings. But um, as someone who actually never experienced real like advocacy until connecting with CRS as a partner, I haven't always worked for them. I was once a, a partner on the other side of things. It's it's very easy to get involved. It's very easy now with email um, to send emails, to write letters, letters to the editor. Um, and we're going to be going over that on the 22nd with Bread for the World and CRS. We can provide you talking points. We have videos. We can educate you because not everyone is a Pat or a Father Ken or a Donna. Not everyone, you know, has had the um, ability or even the knowledge to do this before, much like I didn't just five years ago. I had never d- participated in advocacy before. Um, and now actually with Zoom, we talk about recording this podcast on Zoom. A lot of our senators and Congress people are taking virtual visits. So at first you might think, oh, that seems kind of a bummer. I'd rather go to the office. But you know what? This gives us a lot more access and easier access to them. So we want to set you up for success. We want to, you know, fulfill our moral obligation to provide that assistance and address those root causes. So I'm so excited. And Sherry from Bread from the World is awesome. And we're both going to be able to share with you some tools. And we really just want to equip you. We want to set everyone up for success so that, um, you know, our government can hear our united voices as Catholics and people of faith or, you know, people that care, (laughs) people that want justice. Um, We want to make sure that we set you up for success. So um, I'm looking forward to being able to share some of those tools that we have to advocate. It's not as scary as it seems. We even have links on our website and QR codes. You can do it right there from your computer. We auto-populate your representative and your uh, or your senators for you. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to be able to share that with you all and grateful for the opportunity for people like Pat. <laughs> And, you know, you both made, Jessica and Pat in particular, both made great points about sort of the, there's a, there's a strategy to this. You know, it's it's a lot easier now than it was before. I mean, when you mm-hmm. literally had to hand write a letter and, and send things off. Though, I, and when I talk to representatives from congressman's office, they still tell me that letter writing actually has a great deal because so few people do it now. But the people who do do it, actually, it carries a little bit more weight that you put the effort into writing a letter. So don't forget about that. What doesn't carry very, uh, very little weight is uh, tweets. Tweets really don't care. And right now, it seems like most people feel that their advocacy takes place on social media, which is fine. You know, I don't have a problem with social media. It certainly has its place, but it's not the silver bullet. 
the the work that that the three of you, Father Ken, Pat, and Jessica, have all talked about, what is is real advocacy, getting to know the people who are making these decisions, figuring out how you can can help persuade them into understanding these positions. And the only way that happens is through attending meetings like this and meeting people who have some expertise in this field uh, where you can actually, you know, make real change. Jessica, you said yourself, you know, prior to a few years ago, you had no idea how to do any of this stuff, right? But it was, it was from learning from experts in the field that really helped you. And now you are the expert in the field, Jessica. So good job. Well, I don't think I'd call me an expert. We have (laughs) excellent teams from CRS in DC, in Baltimore and around the U S that, uh, give me the talking points and educate <laughs> me. So I'm in the same spot as everyone else uh, being supported by our staff that is really good at this. <laughs> but thanks. I'll pretend. <laughs> no, you, you know, know oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Mike. No, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, listen, the, the benefit of, of programs like this, like, like Saturday's program is even if you, you're getting invaluable training, not just for this particular topic, you're learning how to advocate, the, the, the basic pr- principles of advocacy can be used for all sorts of issues. So you're actually going to get a skill sets that you can use all over the place. That's why yeah. when I hear about things like this going on and then people don't show up or not enough people show up or it's not getting a big crowd, I just kind of scratch my head and go, you, you guys are missing an incredible opportunity, even if food insecurity isn't the number one thing on your on your to-do list mm-hmm. this is a great opportunity so i hope people will take advantage of it and come to it just for no other reason that's a great opportunity in addition to all the good reasons come to it. and i was gonna say i'm oh, sorry pat i just wanted to add to that i've been on um conference calls with crs before and i'm sure bread for the world is the same but the skills that they have taught about how to write a letter to the editor for instance you know as somebody in journalism listening to you guys teach that, you know, you nailed it, you know, and, 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 and like Mike said, like you can, by teaching those skills, like how to write a letter to the editor or, or, or your congressman, it's good for so many different uh, uh, topics. So, you know, just to come to and, and, and hear that and those skills can be learned from multiple things. I'm sorry, Pat, what were you going to say? Um, I've had the opportunity probably to make Hill visits in Washington, maybe about four times now. And um, and first of all, that's a very empowering experience to do that. But secondly, I remember in one of the, the congressional visits we did, um, we were asking them about emails. And the aide that we were talking to went over to a windowsill and came back with a stack of emails. And they said, we are charged every day to sort out all these emails according to topic and to indicate whether it's a a yay or a nay on that particular topic. So those, your voice counts. Your voice does count. So somebody is paying attention, you know, to those messages that you send out. So even though it seems to go into cyberspace and Maybe seems like nothing's happening. Somebody is paying attention. And so when you say like, ah, I'm just not going to do this, you know, your voice is being silenced, you know, for the, for the helping to bring about really the reign of God. You know, so it's really important, you know, if we want a more just world, you know, who's going to do that? It's up to us. You know, that's part of our baptismal call to discipleship. To, bring, to help bring about the reign of God. And the reign of God, you know, means everybody has enough to eat. Everybody's got dignified work. You know, that we're brother, we see each other as brothers and sisters, not as us, them. Donna, you know, you um, oversee the pastoral department of the diocese. And, um, you know, we have been certainly working on the, Eucharistic revival for the last several months now, year maybe, I don't know, it's been a while. And, um, you know, when I hear conversations about this, it, it actually reminds me of some of the work we're doing on that, where we continue to remind people that the work we do 
you know, the work we do in, in social justice, it all kind of emanates from our, our faith and our Christianity and, and, and from the Eucharist. It's, it's all part of what it means to be Christian and caring for people. I'm listening to Pat talk about that. You know, we don't, it's, it's not often, I feel like, I feel like from time to time, there are these walls between the, the social justice advocacy and the spiritual nature of the Catholic Church, when in reality, they're actually very intertwined, at least, at least in their heart. It's, we figure out some ways of separating ourselves from each other, but the truth of the matter is they, they really do feed into each other, right, Donna? They do, actually. So I love that you're making the linkage to the Eucharistic Revival, because that will be uh, how we open on Saturday is the theme of the Eucharistic revival. I mean, what does our logo actually say? It's the my flesh for the life of the world. And I think anybody who separates the um, works of mercy from their spiritual life, I think the point you made around the fact that everything emanates from the Eucharist and what Jesus came to do. I love Pat's language, right? Is bringing about the kingdom of God here. And that's our work. So I think part of the hope in the Eucharistic revival is that, you know, the the statistics are low, right? You look at the big research houses, you look at the the research they come forward with, is only 31% of Catholics believe the real presence of Jesus exists in the Eucharist. So clearly we have work to do there. But if somehow you can separate the work you are called to do, as Pat said, right? The baptismal call to discipleship, and to be the hands and feet of Jesus, if somehow you're separating that from your spirituality or you think that work belongs to someone else, we're not all called to do all things. But if somehow you're separating your spiritual life from the work that's necessary that needs to go on, I think it's a really good time to sort of pause and reflect around who is Jesus to you, right? What does he mean to you? What is your relationship with him? What what has he taught us? And to go forward from there. And that's why I'm hoping um, people will come on Saturday and learn. Because to credit to Pat and her fellow team members who really pushed to have this event, is that there's teaching. My father, Ken, is going to do some teaching, but there's the equipping piece. And I love what Jessica said, like, advocacy seems kind of daunting, you know, and advocacy does seem kind of daunting. But you make it so simple, Jessica, and so does Sherry, right, in terms of what's possible. So in this time of Eucharistic revival, how are you the hands and feet of Jesus? And I think that would be a really important thing to consider as we go forward. And even Father Ken mentioned earlier, the social justice ministries in the diocese are are a smaller number of ministries by parish, right? We have 62 parishes, but we have about 16 dedicated social justice ministries in the diocese. So it's time to grow those. And the, the aim really here was that this would be our first event and this would ultimately become an annual event and not just from an education teaching standpoint, but from, from an equipping standpoint, like teach leaders what they need in order to, to grow their ministries. And also for those who attend to go back to their parishes and equip their parishes to take this work on. That's the hope. And also, if you attend and you belong to a parish, you might not even know that that parish has a a social justice ministry. Or if you belong to a parish that doesn't have one, you know, maybe you could get best practices and start one at your own. So I think that it's a good place for an exchange of ideas as well. Right. And that's really the hope is the sharing that will happen across the people that are there. And, And Jen, you make a great point. Like, well, what if we don't have it? but your heart is on fire for this. Come, come Mm -hmm. and learn, come and, and take everything in that you're going to be taught from father Ken, who's going to do teaching on the social teachings of the church from Jessica and Sherry, who are going to tell you like, here's how you do it. Um, And, and it's not as hard as you think, right? I love what Jessica says, like five years ago, you know, advocacy seemed really hard to me, you know, but now it's not listen to Jessica. It just flows right out of her. You know, so and I think the um, the articulation of the need and what Jesus would what what he hopes he's got a vested interest in every single one of us. What does he hope we will do? So we're just hoping that this this is something that actually benefits and we're going to make it an annual event. 
We started with hunger first and it's a perfect time. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a great opportunity. And, uh, you know, we've talked about a lot of big topics here. We've certainly talked about how the influence of, of how we eat, and the, the methodology of how we eat it, you know, those are very big terms. Uh, but sometimes also to, re to remember that, um, you know, that need exists all throughout South Jersey, both in wealthy towns and in, and in poorer towns. You know, I worked for another organization 20 years ago and was shocked to learn that my very middle class town had, number one, that it had a homeless shelter at all. And number two, that it had a number of homeless that were in it. And I was further shocked in the years since to see how many people do rely on food banks all across the country, all across the uh, across South Jersey, even to the point of having to create a food bank for our college students at Rhone University. Um, food insecurity was so, so problematic for young people attending college that they had to create a food bank just for them and not just for Catholic. I mean, it wasn't for our Newman Center folks. It was for all all students at, at Rowan University, because for so many of them, it wasn't so simple. You would think if you have the money to go to uh, a, a college that you've had plenty of money to, to eat, but that truly wasn't the case. So food insecurity is far more present than I think people realize and oftentimes uh, affects more people that perhaps you don't realize looking at them from the outside that they are they are in difficulty. So... Don't assume the the poor that you see on TV or represented in television is where that is where that need exists, and it exists all around us. So, and Jen, of course, this is something that you've always been very interested in. Oh, definitely. You know me; I've talked about social justice before on here. Um, I, you know, well, that, I did not, that did not come up in your job interview, by the way. I don't know how he missed that. I found that on, I found that uh, that out about you on the job. It was fascinating. Yeah, it was, right? I, yeah, it's a good I know, I'm, I'm sure. I was like, hey, let's do another podcast about blank. And let's do another about blank. And Mike's like, wait, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, you know, I was thinking about Donna when you said a second ago when you were like, we don't know what our skills are. You know, Jessica said five years ago she didn't know she'd be doing this. When you said that, in my mind, I was like, I didn't know one year ago I'd be doing a podcast. So you never know what your skills are. <laughs> That's right. Until someone pushes you just a little bit. And just a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm really looking forward to coming on the, on the 22nd, seeing everybody in, in person. Um, yeah. Will there be any, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, we, we probably did ourselves a disservice by not mentioning this in the beginning, but it'll certainly be in the show notes. If people want to learn more about this particular event, uh, I recommend that they go to, um, camdiocese.org in our events page. We have links to the flyer um, and uh, information on when and where it will be. We also have to include a fantastic article by our correspondent, Christina Leslie, who did a great uh, write-up on the event uh, in this week's paper, I believe, Jen? Yep, Mike. The, it's the issue that will publish, uh, that does publish on October 14th. It's also online, yes, and so where we speak to uh, Jessica, and uh, we also speak to uh, Sherry, who's not on the podcast. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a great article. You can find out more. Like Mike said, you can go to camdendiocese.org slash F, I'm sorry, HFI to register. And uh, I believe there's, there's still room for anybody who wants to come. Yeah, and it's October 22nd from 9 to 3 at the Church of the Holy Family's Aquin Center, uh, 226 Herful Road, Sewell, which is a great uh, parish, by the way, for anyone who's never been there before. It's uh, it's in the middle of a residential area, surrounded by trees. You're, you, you feel like you're in the, I don't know, you feel like you kind of feel like you're in Eden, actually. It's, it's a very great place to go. It's a very comfortable place. So I hope people will go to it because it's, uh, it's a really nice event and it's a really nice place. Um, Can I say two things? Oh, sorry. Donna, Can I just say two things? Is that okay? Could you please so, say two things? <laughs> okay. So, so Jen, this is going to be like Joachim, Joachim in nope. the beginning of the podcast. So camdendiocese.org slash HFJ. Oh, that's a J. So that's sorry. A J. That's Thank okay. You, Hunger for justice. It's the acronym for the event. Um, and the other thing is, 
it's free. So come, come and learn from people from across the diocese. Come and listen to Father Ken. Come listen to Jessica. Come listen to Sherry. Meet other people, other like-minded people, and come and learn. Come and learn how we can take care of all of these all these folks. And it's free. You only have to bring a non-perishable food item to come through the door. And even if you forget that non-perishable food item for the Holy Family Food Pantry, we're going to let you in anyway. (laughs) But we would like you to do that. And we're also encouraging people to bring their own coffee cups and water bottles to um, for environmental impact. And we'll be serving fair trade coffee. So we're trying to get the complete picture going here. Mm -hmm. So that's great. You got to practice what you preach. Absolutely. The, uh, you know, Donna, you mentioned this earlier that, the, so this is going to be an annual event. Have you, have you and the, the crew figured out what some of the future events might be about? Well, uh, <laughs> well so, asking the so, hard questions. <laughs> Donna, you're so, not done with this one. Have you already planned the next one? Is that, that's what you just asked. That would be exactly right. So, so we'll sit with the, with the core team after this event, kind of do the, you know, after action review, what went well, what did we learn? How can we plan next year's to be better? Now, we also know that some of the um, social teachings of the church can be complicated, can be divisive. Uh, so we thought, let's just start with one that literally everyone agrees on, is that we don't want anyone to be hungry. So let's start there. If we do a good job with the teaching, the, what the church teaches, and we can equip people to do this, then we build the trust with those who are working in these ministries to do something similar with some of the harder topics, right? Pat, would you have a tendency to, to agree with me in that space? Because we know some of this is complicated. Yes, yes. And okay. um, th- this is just, uh, again, as Mike said, you know, the skills that you learn are applicable, you know, in advocacy across the board. I think people have to tap into their passion. So whatever makes you fire, I, I've told people before, you know, like when you, one of the images for the spirit is fire and whatever gets you fired up, I think that's the spirit speaking in you saying like, okay, if it's about the environment, you're fired up about that, then use your, your skills to create better environment for our world. If it's abortion, if it's hunger, if it's housing, you know, whatever those issues are that get you fired up, I think that's the spirit calling you to be that voice and to be the hands and feet of Christ, you know, to bring about justice and peace in our world. I have a, a, a reflection that I'd like to share with you, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. Sure. Okay. So this is um, a little reflection from The Weight of Nothing um, by Mary Lou Guanaki. Tell me the weight of a snowflake, a squirrel asked a wild dove. Nothing more than nothing was the answer. In that case, I must tell you a marvelous story, the squirrel said. I sat on the branch of a fir close to its trunk when it began to snow. Not heavily, not in a raging blizzard. No, just like in a dream without any violence. Since I did not have anything better to do, I counted the snowflakes settling on the twigs and needles of my branch. Their number was exactly 3,741,952. When the next snowflake dropped onto the branch, nothing more than nothing, as you say, the branch broke off. Having said that, the squirrel scampered away. The dove, since Noah's time and authority on the matter of peace, thought about the story for a while and finally said to herself, perhaps there is only one person's voice lacking for justice and peace to come about in the world. Wow. I love that. That's that's sweet. Lovely. And powerful. I like that. Yeah, I think the, the... the point, or not the point, but the one of the recommendations is not to be the one voice lacking. I would agree with that. Absolutely. So, by the way, does that does all of this mean that Jen Morrow is now part of the, the core team? For this? <laughs> Why are you always trying to volunteer me for things? Donna, Works for me. Because we need you. <laughs> no, you know, Donna, I'm very passionate about this. So, you know, that's why I'm. Yeah, I, I could go on and on about it. So I'm very passionate. That's why I can't wait to be there on the 22nd. I volunteered to cover it because I want to be there and learn more. Like Mike said, you know, actually, like you said, Pat, uh, when you find 
one or one passion it it does branch out one of my passions is the environment um and making sure we have you know sustainable uh, environment anyway so food goes right into that so sure well thank you all for joining us today this was really great we i hope it's a nice crowd on saturday and uh thank you for doing it i look forward to seeing what the the future holds i can't wait to see what next year you guys do so father ken and Jessica and Pat, thank you all very much. And Donna, of course.